uh, I thank the Lord for another opportunity that he's given us to be here. Um, once again, y'all, we in the book of James today, you know, um, I'm definitely being, you know, a servant of the Lord and what's been asked of me is to stay in the book of James so we can finish it. So, you know, as the Bible study, we can all grow uh, in reading the word of God. And that's just to give a, a recap for some of you guys who have uh, been here or here or here for the first time. At first, we talked about the book of James chapter 2 about faith and works being a deadly combination that you can't just have faith. You got to be able to do the work and then you can't just have work. You got to have faith. And we talked about that last week. We talked about now is the time. Now is the time to believe God. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the hour to get right with God. And it was an awesome time last week. Uh, my brother in the Lord over there, Isaac, received the Holy Ghost after Bible study. Yeah. Uh, yeah. like that one to be telling everybody. Yeah, you got the Holy Ghost. Yeah. You got so, uh, it. Now is the time. And it was showing that now is the time. And the Lord was see proving himself just in that. Um, that now is the time to get right with God and believe in God. And James, like I said, was exhorting the church last week to contend for the faith um, with all the trials and situations that you go through. This is the hour to contend for the faith. And he was showing us and teaching us that we are all in the school of Christ. And that in the school of Christ, there are some classes that you got to take that you don't want to want to take. Like some of us need more classes on patience. We ain't got the patience that we need. Some of us need to take some more classes on our love for other people and things of that nature. And today, James has us right back in the school of Christ, y'all. And this was one of those lessons this summer that I pray that Lord give me the, the peace to not teach this. Because it, it came down my street first. First person that he cut was me. And I'm like, Lord, I don't want to teach this. This week, Lord, give me something else. And this summer, he gave me something else that I taught that I knew was awesome. You know, it's an awesome word. But that same word that came back and now it's got to go forth tonight um, because the word is the word. So I'm excited about the word tonight. Um, we're going to be in the book of James, chapter 3. We're going to pull it up here in just a second. And uh, just to give you a little cap of what it's dealing with, um, the book of James, chapter 3, deals with your mouth. Dealing with taming your tongue. So tonight, the topic of tonight in the book of James chapter 3 is before you speak. Before you speak. And before we do anything, y'all, we're going to go ahead and go before the Lord first. So everybody will bow their heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this gathering, God. We thank you for another awesome opportunity to come before your presence, oh God. God, we give you thanks and praise, oh God, that you saw fit, oh God, to give us another opportunity to come before you, oh God. So many people are in their grave right now. So many people are dying of sicknesses and diseases. So many are dying from Ebola, oh God. They're coming before you in judgment swiftly, oh God. Will we give you thanks and praise, oh God, that you're working with us, God. You're giving us time to get it right with you, oh God, before you come for us, oh God. So, Father, we give you thanks and praise for your mercy and grace that's so undeserving, oh God. Now, Father God, we ask in the name of Jesus, oh God, that you anoint, Father God, your servant with the words from heaven, oh God. Cause the flesh to sit down, that the spirit may speak to your people in this hour, oh God. Give them an ear to hear that which you would have your servant to speak, oh God. Father God, I ask that you increase, that I may decrease, oh God. In the name of Jesus, bind every distraction, every hindrance, oh God. They were dare hinder, Father God, your word from prevailing in this place. Let it prevail. Prevail, oh God. Cause it, Father God, to draw those that are on their way, oh God. Cause everything that may hinder them from getting here, oh God. Cause them to get here, oh God. Move every weight and every sin, oh God, that may hinder them in the name of Jesus, God. Cause them, Father God, with urgency, God, to get to the place where your word is being, Father God, taught, oh God. In the name of Jesus, bless your people in the atmosphere, oh God. Most of all, God, get the glory tonight. This is your people. This is your hour. This is your word, Father God. And I'm your servant, so have your way. Sit down in the Bible study, oh God. Feel free to say whatever you want to say. This is your hour, oh God, that you be magnified. You said if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. So be lifted up in this atmosphere, oh God. Be exalted in the atmosphere and speak to your people. Teach us, oh God. Father God, you got to cut us, cut us, oh God, because we know it's going to work for our good. We thank you and bless us and we bless you in advance in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you speak, it's 
So Bree's going to touch it and bring it on up here, y'all. Now, again, like I said, man, that's really big. Before you oh. speak, now, like I talked about before, last week we talked about now is the time dealing with the testing of your faith. And then Kevin dealt with faith and works, which was a deadly combination. And now James begins to deal with taming your tongue. And he is writing to edify the church and to let them know that you need to tame your tongue and being careful what you allow to just come out of your mouth. And he jumps right into it. And the very first thing he deals with with taming your tongue is he deals with teaching. So we're going to jump right on into it, y'all. The book of James, chapter 3, verse number 1. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Now, what does he mean when he talks about masters? He's talking about be not many teachers. Why? Because we shall receive a greater condemnation. God holds teachers, preachers, those who are standing up in a congregation leading or teaching. He holds us at such a higher standard and our judgment will be so much greater. That, that's why James, he encourages the church First of all, in taming your mouth, don't let everybody be a teacher. It's not that he's discouraging people not to walk in what giftings and talents and anointings God has given them, but he gives a caution to the church that before you do anything, let there not be everybody being a teacher because your level of judgment is going to be so much greater because we shall receive a greater condemnation. There are so many people, even back in the days of James, there was so much false teaching going forth. People talking nonsense and they were teaching false doctrine and false things that were going forth in the land. But James had to exhort the church while they were scattered abroad not to allow just anybody to just get up and teach before you. Doesn't matter how uh, this person feels or that person feels. If it's not the Lord that has called you to that office, you have to be mindful that if you're doing it and God has not called you to do that, there is a great judgment. Many people look at teaching and preaching as it's something fun and good. I can be up there and press this girl or this dude as if it's something uh, of, of, of leisure. That it's a fun thing that you can look good and your little suit and tie. But at at the end of the day, when you stand before the Lord in judgment day, if what you were saying did not line up with the word of God, if you were saying nonsense before the people just to appease other people, you have a great judgment that you're going to stand before. And the Bible says every idle word you speak, you shall give an account for on the day of judgment. In the book of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse 36 and 37. Every idle word, as I sit here and I think about what I'm saying to you guys right now, every word that's coming out of my mouth, I will give an account for on the day of judgment. Mm -hmm. I didn't call myself to be a teacher. I, I, I just came into the Bible study and was just one of y'all just sitting in here. And as God began to grow me, the Bible says a man's gift maketh room for them. And bringing them before great men. And it was the Lord that made room for me. I didn't call myself. One day Kevin just happened to see me as I was teaching. And the Lord put me on his heart. And he called me. And he said, do you think you can get up and you can teach a Bible study? And I got up and I said, oh yeah, I think I can do that. Because he saw what giftings that God had put in me. And I got up and taught the Bible study. He said, okay, now we have teachers. Because before that, there wasn't no other teachers in the Bible study. So if Kevin wasn't a teacher during that time if we happened to miss it, it just wasn't going to be nobody who was going to teach there were people who could get up and exhort and mention a few scriptures but there was no teachers in the body of Christ in here there was people that were gifted, talented, anointed you had people that can intercede for you you had people who can tarry for you with the Holy Ghost you had people who can lay hands on you speak a prophetic word you had people who can heal, deliver you had leaders, you had business people who could design you all stuff. but there was not teachers in the body so the Lord brought me in, he brought B. James, and he brought people in because there was a need for teachers. But James cautions us that understand, be very sober and understand that you shall have a greater a condemnation held at a higher standard and a greater accountability. I put up there an example of why it's so important 
that we have to, before we speak, making sure that we have tamed our tongue, that when we speak, we're not speaking out of our flesh, but we're being, we're speaking based on the spirit. That's why it's always in order to pray. Before you get up to speak, that's why it's, I, I love it, being able to pray before we do anything, because you don't know what may happen or who may walk in here. Somebody may be dealing with some craziness, and it's always in order to pray, so God will cover the atmosphere so no foolishness goes on. So before you speak, it's always in order to make sure your tongue is tame. And I put up here an example up here about this video. I sent this to Sister Monica and a few other people. And this is an example of why before you speak, it's so crucial that before you speak, you got to know what you're talking about. And you guys got to see this. It's hilarious, but it's real. And y'all got to see this. It's only one minute long. I want y'all to see this. Because God takes pleasure when we're happy. That's the thing that gives him the greatest joy this morning. So I want you to know this morning, just do good for your own self. Do good because God wants you to be happy. When you come to church, when you worship him, you're not doing it for God, really. You're doing it for yourself. Because that's what makes God happy. Amen. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to this. I will leave no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. Now that was a perfect example of people that are up teaching and they're teaching nonsense. He laid it out that at no point, at no point in all of her rambling, everything said, at no point in what she said, did she say anything that would be considered a rational thought, anything that even lined up remotely with the word. It didn't matter what version of the Bible, you could have got the message Bible at no point did she say anything that lined up with the word of God? And there were hundreds and thousands of people in that place. And when she stands before the Lord on judgment day, those words will be recited back to her. We come to the house of God. We come, we worship God because first of all, he's worthy to be worshiped. And he gives a command that you're supposed to come and worship him. Back in the Old Testament, if you decided that you weren't going to get up and come to church to worship and give God the praise, don't let Moses come looking for you. Because if he found you or you sleep, oh, that was going to be a bad day for you because you was going to be stoned to death. If you was out doing your homework, like, oh, man, I got this exam to study for, that was going to be a costly exam because you was going to get stoned to death. <laughs> gonna pull you on out. Everybody else who had to study, this is what not to do. And they were gonna stay with stone you right there. Everybody else see this? Now you don't don't you miss church for that exam. You should have studied before you got out to church. So you wanna die or you wanna do well on the exam? I, a lot of you wouldn't want to die yet. You would want to just I would come to church and put God first. And this is what happened in the Old Testament. You came and you worship God because he is worthy to be praised. He is worthy to be worshipped. We worship him. We ain't doing it for ourselves. We're doing it because he's worthy to be praised. He is to be magnified in the house of God is where we come into a hospital because it gives us the ammunition of things we need to go out there and fight the enemy that we're fighting because the enemy is throwing so much nonsense out there in the world and we need to be equipped with the word of God so we know how to speak the things of God and not of our flesh. So James, again, he exhorts the church, don't be many uh, masters or teachers because you shall receive a greater condemnation. Because what, what does he say? For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is perfect man and able to uh, uh, also bridle the whole body. He says, for in many things we offend all people. We offend everybody. When you get up here and you teach, this is not something that's glamorous. But it's something that when the word goes forth, to be honest, the word of God, the word is just the word. It cuts. And, you know, it's nothing personal. When the word comes down, it cuts, it cuts. It ain't no respecter of persons. But when it goes forth, it cuts. And there's some people, they get offended when the word of God goes forth. 
But when the word goes forth to, to cut down on collateral damage, James lays it out to, to let everybody know, don't let everybody be a teacher because not everybody is perfect, meaning not everybody has come to the state of maturity and experience and being seasoned in the word of God. So he was saying, not, don't let anybody just get up and teach because not everybody's been tamed. Their mouth has not been tamed. There are some people still walking in their flesh, and at any moment, they're ready to swing on somebody. They may have just got saved. They may be walking with the Lord. They may have told this person and that person about Jesus. They may have confessed, you know, I love Jesus. But if that, that person comes up to them at the wrong time, then you might find them fighting, you know what I'm saying, trying to knock somebody up. Like, dude, who's coming at me wrong, you know what I'm saying? So I'm like, bro, what you want to do? You know what I mean? Real quick, in the flesh, real quick, not exemplifying uh, the Lord in that situation. So James exhorts that let us know that we offend all. And if any man does not offend in the word, he is a perfect man, meaning you are mature. You've come to a right relationship with God to where you submitted your all to God, that you have a single heart toward God, totally obedient and devoted to God, to where you have, there is no vacancies in you to where the flesh can have its way. So that when you begin to speak, you're not speaking based on your flesh or what your flesh has to say, but you're being an obedient servant of the Lord. Now, this ain't about me. This is about the Lord. And when you begin to speak, you're speaking what God would have the people of God to know. And he says that if you are a perfect man, you're able to also bridle the whole body. Even when you think about a natural teacher, the job of a natural teacher is her job is to instruct and her job is to motivate. But most of all, her job is to correct. So if you get something wrong, oh, I know the answer. I know that's the answer is for it. No, Timmy, the answer is not for it. Do it again. The teacher's job is to correct, and sometimes teachers can be brutal. Some teachers can hurt your feelings. Some teachers can offend you and say, you you, you never going to get it. You gonna, you're not going to be nothing more than sorry like your sorry daddy or your sorry mom. And that can be something that offends that young man or that young woman, and it can cause them to go on to life holding on to those things to where they never feel like they could ever be something. So too, just as it is in the natural, so too in the spiritual, uh, James lets us know, don't let all speak because we offend a lot of people and you don't want the ministry to be an excuse that somebody gives the Lord on judgment. Well, the reason why I didn't get saved is because such and such was saying, what you need to do is you need what the Lord told me to tell you is you need to get your stinking attitude together out there doing God knows what with God knows who and how long you've been out there. How long was you in there with such a what you need to do is you need to repent. You need to and all of that which is opinion and the wrong type of attitude. God could have given a word but how you give that word can determine whether that person is really going to hear what God is saying. If that person's tongue has not been tamed, if they've not been changed, if the Holy Ghost has not come in and changed them, they can real quick get in the flesh and cause some Somebody to go astray and not hear the message of the Lord because they're operating in their own personal opinion or feelings because they might not like somebody and they will say, oh God, they gave me a word. So what I'm going to tell that person is I'm going to give them a piece of my mind rather than saying, let me push my flesh aside. This ain't about me. This is about the Lord. So James Edify, he encourages us that before you speak, before you speak, make sure everybody doesn't teach because we offend many people in a lot of things. Verse number three it says, behold, we put bits, and this was awesome, y'all, when I got to this verse. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Now, it begins to talk about how that you see a horse is big, it's huge, it can kick you and kill you instantly. It can take off running, you fly off that horse, and you can be killed instantly. But how big this creature is and how wild it is, all it takes is to put a bit in that horse's mouth. And if you put a bit in that horse's mouth, you can uh, control wherever that horse goes. You can control it. You cause it to obey you. So too, the Lord allows James to use this bit that is put in a horse's mouth as an illustration to our mouths. 
That when you put, when the Lord uh, gets a hold of our mouth, if he can get a hold of your mouth, he can control every place you go. He can control the things that come out of your mouth. Instead of you talking about this person or talking about that person, instead of you tearing at that person and saying that person, you ain't no good, or cussing at this person or cussing at that person, if God can get a hold of your mouth to where instead of you cursing that person and talking about that person that's going in a club, you can be standing in the gap being led by God saying well, let me stand in the gap and let me pray for this person let me pray that God will deliver this person let me pray if God can get a hold of your mouth he can cause your mouth to obey him and not your flesh obey him and not obey what you want to do cause you to stand in the gap because they might not have somebody who will stand in the gap for them if God can get your mouth he can cause change to come because the Bible says in the book of Romans we don't know how we ought to pray but the Holy Ghost, it yeah. intercedes for us in words that cannot be uttered. There are things deep down inside of us, things that are very dark, very wicked, deep down inside of us that we don't even know is deep down inside of us. But the Holy Ghost, it searches us and it prays for us in words that cannot be uttered. That's why we need the Holy Ghost, because the Lord out of all things, that he could have used to show that you've been delivered, that you've been saved, that you've been filled with the Holy Ghost. He allows the tongue as the evidence that you've been changed because the mouth is an unruly thing. It's a very wicked thing. It does a lot. It can boast of many wicked things, but God says if I can get a hold of your mouth, I can cause things to change and shift. I can cause you to pray for people and to be an intercessor and a kingdom builder for me. Behold, now this one, y'all, was, was some revelation here when I was reading verse number four. It says, Behold, also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm, meaning a wheel, whithsoever the governor, listen, now that helm represents a wheel. And what was so interesting is that he compares this ship to us and that that uh, the ship is so big and it's so great yet that huge ship is controlled by a little bitty wheel and that wheel determines what direction no matter what winds and storms come their way that little bitty wheel determines the direction of where that boat goes so too that little bitty wheel represents our mouth if jesus the captain or the governor here can get a hold of our mouth and if he can take the wheel of our mouth that he can control the direction of whatever is going on no matter what storm comes our way he can control what's going on in the midst of storms and things that's coming our way instead of us being fearful when storms come our way and thinking like I'm going to die in this situation I'm not going to make it if God can get a hold of our mouth in the midst of the winds and the storm he can cause us to speak to the storm and tell the storm to pass the Bible says in the book of Mark chapter number four that when they were getting ready and they to preach this message when they were getting ready to pass over to the other side the Bible says that this storm this strange storm broke out and Jesus was down in the boat asleep and the wind started rustling and it rained and everything was coming and the Bible says that they became the disciples they got fearful and they came down to Jesus and they said Jesus don't you care that we're getting ready to perish and Jesus came up and he spoke with his mouth a word and it caused the storms to stop and after he spoke a word with his mouth he turned to the disciples and he says where is your faith at where is your faith at? Why are you so fearful when these storms are going on? Your faith should be in the Lord. That if Jesus is in the boat, you can never sink if Jesus is in the boat. If Jesus is with you, you won't sink. If Jesus can get a hold of your mouth, he can cause you to shift the atmosphere, shift the storms, and not be fearful. Like the storm, you're not going to get the best of me. Fear, you're not going to get the best of me. Devil, you are a lie. I'm not going to die in this storm. I shall live and not die. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Every tongue that rises up against me, God will condemn. Uh, God will condemn. Cancer, you are alive. You will not take me. I have greater works to do for the Lord. I shall live and not die. I shall
shall declare the works of the Lord. I shall get past this storm because on the other side could be somebody else's deliverance and I ain't got time to die in this storm. If God can just get a hold of your mouth and turn it whichever way he determines if he can turn it in a way that he have it, if he can turn your mouth to where instead of complaining in the midst of the storm or worrying that you're going to die in the storm, if he can get a hold of your mouth and turn it to where you don't complain but you just start giving God praise in the midst of the, turn, of the storm he can cause things to shift to where where that storm doesn't get the best of you. And James uses these great illustrations to show how small the tongue is, but how powerful it can be if you allow the Lord to get a hold of your mouth. That before you speak, before you open up your mouth, that you allow the Lord to get a hold of your mouth. And that it isn't about you, but it's about the Lord. And if you allow it to where you don't speak of your flesh, but you allow the spirit to speak. And where God brings us all to a place to where we learn how to respond and not react. God always wants to bring us to a place, even the spiritual maturity as James is teaching them, to where they tame their tongue. To where they come to a place that they learn to respond to situations and not react. There's a difference between responding to something and reacting to something. The disciples reacted to the storm instead of responding to it. The storm had something to say to them, but they should have responded back to the storm and let the storm know, you are not going to get the best of me because you are saying something that's contrary to the word of God. The word of God says this. We have to get to a place to where we respond the right way and in a manner in which God would have us to respond. And during these times when they were being afflicted they're, with their uh, the storms and the trials of life, their tongue was not tamed. They were not speaking in the manner in which God would have them. So there had to be the taming of their tongue. And James had to get them in order. First of all, don't let everybody be teaching because you offend all. And then he goes down the line with all these comparisons of the tongue. And he compares it to a lot of great things until he gets to the point where he really lets you know what the tongue is really about. Verse number five, he says, even so the tongue, and he finally gets to it after all the illustrations, even so the tongue is a little member and it boasts of great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And it lets it, it lets it be known right here that the tongue is a small thing. The tongue is a very small thing, but it boasts of a lot of things. Have you ever heard somebody that uh, as they were talking, they were just talking all about themselves. I did this and I've done that. I have all these accomplishments. I've got this money. I got this car. I got this job. I got all this. And they boast of a lot of things. With that small member, it can boast of a lot of things and it can build up so much pride. And not giving God the glory, but glorifying this flesh and magnifying this flesh. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Meaning, how small, how a small little fire can set an entire force to blaze. How your mouth can, it is so deadly and it's so poisonous that your mouth uh, can set a fire and can destroy an entire force. That's what James likens our tongue to be. That is something they can say. Can you imagine your mouth being so deadly it can set a whole force on fire? That's a deadly tongue. But so too, if God can get a hold of your mouth, he can cause your mouth to set a whole campus on fire to where you're interceding and praying for people. That's why before you speak, that God needs to tame our tongues and get us in order. Your mouth can be used for good or it can be used for bad. It can be used to build people up or it can cause people to fall back in their flesh. I, I remember an uh, example I gave when we had that... Uh, we did that question and answer session. I know some of y'all remember when we did that. But I gave an example about why it's so important. Be careful things that we say because it can cause people to fall. And I gave an illustration about a prostitute getting up and giving a, uh, giving a testimony. You know, her getting up and saying, you know, I just want to praise the Lord, everybody. You know, I just want to give up. And I can't give my testimony of what the Lord then done for me. And I remember when I was out there in the streets and I was just out there tricking and giving myself to this person and that person. And when I was out there in the world, I used to do everything. And I mean everything. 
And while they're giving this type of testimony, it could be a brother or sister over there that's sitting there and they have things that they've been struggling with. And amidst their hearing that, they could be sitting over there like, man, I wonder what she means by everything. And the service can be over with. And they find themselves going over to that sister like, uh, praise the Lord, sister. You know, uh, just wanted to come over to you and say, uh, George, your testimony. And uh, I was just wondering... Uh, what you mean by everything. And then all of a sudden they find themselves in some nonsense based on uh, the words that are coming out of her mouth. She uses her mouth in a deceptive way that can cause her brother or sister to stumble and cause them to fall back into sin. So James lets us know that uh, we have to be careful with our mouth and how we allow our mouth to get the best of us and how we can cause it to cause our brothers or sisters to stumble. And verse number six, he says, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature. The tongue is a fire, meaning it's a world of iniquity. Our tongue is full of sin, it's full of deception, it's full of wickedness. So the tongue among our members of our body, it defileth the whole body. Jesus gives an illustration when he talks about it in Matthew. He talks about that uh, what comes out of the mouth comes out of the heart. And it's what defiles a man. And what comes out of the heart are evil thoughts, intentions, adulteries, envy, strife. All of these things come out of the heart. And they are the things that defile a man. It's not what comes in you that defiles you. It's what comes out of you. It's what defiles you. And that's why James has to get the church in order. It's these things that's defiling your body and it's set it on fire, the course of nature, meaning the cycle of man's nature, the, the nature of mankind, the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. It sets it on fire and it sets it on fire of hell, meaning of destruction. Our tongue is a very destructive thing. It's something that can destroy many people. For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and have been tamed of mankind. So first of all, James lays it out that all the animals have been tamed. They've been tamed. God has given man the ability to tame uh, the animals. He's given them the blessing to be able to do this. But look what James lays out. Out of all the animals on the earth, the one that cannot or the only beast that cannot be tamed is your mouth. Your mouth, man can't tame your mouth. It takes the Lord to get a hold of your mouth. That's why James has to exhort the church, the taming of your tongue, putting a lock on your mouth, being careful in the things that you may say because the tongue can no man tame. It is unruly. It is full of deadly poisons, meaning your tongue is undisciplined. It will just spit out and say whatever. Your tongue can say the wrong thing, and real quick, you can find yourself in the ER. Your tongue can say the wrong thing, and you can find yourself in a 6 by 10 uh, uh, casket. Your tongue can say the wrong things, and you can find yourself in some prison somewhere. The tongue is a very unruly thing. It's very very wicked. And only the Lord can tame the tongue. That's why he wants to get a hold of our mouth so he can change our tongue to where we use our mouth to glorify God and magnify God and not allow our mouth to get in our flesh to get in the way of what God would have us to do. He wants to get a hold of our mouth so we can bring him glory so that wherever we go when we open up our mouth that we begin to speak the things of God and not the things of our flesh. That we begin to walk in the spirit and not in our flesh ready to fight at any second because somebody said something to us wrong that made us mad but that we're walking in the spirit and we get a hold of our mouth this is where we come to a place of maturity he's speaking to saints that have not fully matured yet because they have not tamed their tongue it was shown that they have not fully matured in Christ yet. And as we are in this school of Christ, y'all, and your academic advisor, Jesus, has got you taking these core requirements. Patience was one of them last week. We talked about that. A lot of y'all got to take 24, 26, 28, maybe 30 hours of patience that the Lord has to allow to come down your way to teach your patience. Some of us need some hours on love, but all of us need the Lord to help us with our mouth. A lot of us may need a lot more credit hours 
Some people might be majoring in taming your tongue. You may have to have 50 credits on taming your tongue and your attitude so God can bring it under subjection. That's why the Bible talks about in the book of Acts that when they were filled with the Holy Ghost, it said the first thing before they were even filled with the Holy Ghost, it said cloven tongues like as a fire sat upon each of them. Then it said they were filled. And so it lays out, it lets it be known, first of all, fire has to sit upon you to burn up some stuff in you. Burn up your attitude. Burn up your pride. Burn up your envy. Burn up your pride. Burn up this something in you that swells up and then wants everybody to see, look at me, look at me. I did this. I did that. Burn up some of the wickedness that's in you. It sat on them first to burn up some stuff. And once it sat on them and burned up some stuff, then it said they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave utter. So the Holy Ghost is like a fire because your tongue, your mouth is like a fire and it sets so many people ablaze and it cuts down so many people and it tears down so many people that when the Holy Ghost comes in, it has to come in like a fire to burn up that old nature of yourself so that when you begin to speak and do the things of God, you begin to set a fire the people that you come into contact with and you begin to be a, a vessel for God that brings people to the Lord. Therefore, bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. So James begins uh, to, uh, to exhort the church, and he lets them know that uh, you guys are blessing God, you're magnifying God in one tongue, but then in another tongue, when you're in a different situation, you're cursing people. People who are made after the similitude, meaning after the image of God. You are supposed to be a representative of Christ, but in one moment, you in church clapping, hallelujah, praise God, Lord, you're worthy. And in another instance, like you ready to knock somebody out. That this should not be, or you ready to curse or cuss somebody out. Somebody who's made after the image of God. These things ought not be. That we, we should be thinking before we speak. That we say, okay, what would the Lord have me to do? There was somebody who came up with, I don't even know if they ever did this, but they was going to make wristbands that, what would Jesus do? That in whatever situation would come down your path, what would, before you react to it or respond to it, what would Jesus do in this situation? Would Jesus say, I'm going to knock you out? Would Jesus say, man, I'll come up curse you? Would Jesus say, man, you ain't nothing? Would Jesus say, what would Jesus say if everybody had that thought in their mind that the world would be a whole lot better? There would be more deliverance. There would be more breakthrough. There would be more love in the body of Christ. There would be more unity if people said, what would Jesus do? In this, there would be a lot less anger. There would be a lot less classes in the school of Christ that a lot of us would need to take if we would have the what would Jesus do in this situation type of attitude. But we don't have that what would Jesus do type attitude. But we need to have that attitude. And James lets it be known that they don't have this. That there were people during this time that were blessing people but cursing people. And this is not something that we should be doing. He said out of the same mouth proceeded blessings and cursing. Brethren, these things ought not so to be. These things should not be. There should never be saints that's talking about the Lord and his goodness and his grace. And in the same instance, they cussing. This is not a good representative of the Lord because people was watching us. They see that uh, things that we ain't supposed to do. The world real quick identifies things that we ain't supposed to do. They don't know the word of God, but they know there's certain things that you call yourself a Christian. Real quick, they'll shake you and say, uh, you ain't supposed to be doing that. I don't know what it says in the word, but I know you ain't supposed to be doing that. You ain't supposed to be saying that. You ain't supposed to be drinking that. You ain't supposed to be right here. You ain't supposed to be sexing this person. You ain't supposed to. They, they'll get you real quick and let you know, but when you let them know about some stuff, you know what I'm saying, they, they, they might be convicted about it, but they'll come real quick and, whoa, whoa, ain't you the same person that told me that I shouldn't be doing this? Well, what was that scripture you said? The, the Matthew 7, was that the scripture? No, that wasn't the scripture I gave you, but I know you're going to quote it because everybody loves judge not, lest you be judged. Everybody loves to quote that <laughs> scripture, lest you be judged, not knowing what it means and what it's talking about. But James exhorts the church that these certain things should not be so. We should not be speaking like then cussing. 
We should not be falling out in the Holy Ghost and ready to fight somebody in the next instance. This ought not be so. We should not be, be already praising God just come out of a church service and we have envy and strife toward each other. We're ready to fight each other. We're ready to talk about each other. We in the car talking about this person, that person. And that's, these things ought not be so. Before we speak, we need to be mindful of, and I need to tame my tongue. Before I speak, Lord, help tame my tongue so that I am a vessel for you. Verse number 11, James says, Doth the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter water? So he begins again. He's giving simple illustrations to the church. Does a water fountain bring forth sweet water and bitter water? No, it doesn't. A water fountain, he's got to bring one or the other. And he lays it out to the church that if you're going to walk with the Lord, you got to bring forth the, the right type of water. You can't bring forth bitter water. you got to bring forth the good water. This fountain, and then natural he was using, represents the Holy Ghost, the spiritual. We are a fountain. That God has filled us up with the Holy Ghost, and we are a fountain. So that when we speak the things of God, we overflow and we pour out the things that God has put into us. But if we are full of bitterness and our water is bitter, what we're pouring out to people isn't like we're pouring out death unto people. And he says this fountain should be pouring out the same thing because a fountain doesn't do that. James is teaching us. He's teaching us Taming the Tongue, section 205. He's got people lined up in a class and he's teaching and Jesus lays out in Matthew 7, 15 through 20, that he begins to talk about um, bearing fruit, that by their fruits you will know them. That uh, a good tree bear good fruit, and a bad tree bear bad fruit. Uh, a bad tree can't bear good fruit, so too a, a good tree can't bear a, a good tree can bear bad fruit, but certain fruit doesn't grow on certain trees. A pear tree is not going to have apples growing on it. A banana tree ain't going to have oranges growing on it. So by their fruits, you will know them. So people are looking at our fruits all the time, and we want to make sure that the words of our mouth is bearing the right type of fruit, that we're bearing the fruit of the Lord, that we're speaking the things of God, that we're edifying people so that when people see us, they see that we represent the uh, God. We represent the things of God that we are, we are truly children of God and that we're not like the world but we've been separated and our conduct shows that we've been separated. The way we treat each other shows that we've been separated. If we're not treating each other right, it shows that maybe we need to get some things in order. We need to go back to the drawing board and say, Lord fix me, creating me a clean heart. Renewing me a right spirit. My spirit obviously ain't right if I say I love you and I hate my brother. I say that I I'm willing to obey you and serve you, but I won't submit to what you're calling for. I won't submit to leadership. I won't submit to being obedient to what those over me are telling me that I need to do. I'm obviously, I don't really love you because if I love you, I'll keep your commandments. I'll keep what you have said. Obey them that have the rule over you. That's what his word says. Obey them that have the rule over you. So when we obey, it's not that we're obeying man, but it's as unto the Lord. So these are things that James is teaching us to obey so that we're bearing forth right type of fruit. We're almost done here, y'all. Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olive tree, uh, olive berries? Either a vine, fig, so can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. So he gives more illustrations because he wants to make sure it's transparent. That before anybody speaks, to get people's mouth in order, that he deals with the faith, he deals with the, the uh, uh, faith and works in combination, and now he's dealing with the mouth. He wants to make sure that he drives it home, that, that we understand that a fig tree can't bear forth olives, because understand the olive represents the anointing. It represents the anointing of God. And a fig tree which doesn't bear anything, that doesn't, it really represents not having God, it can't bear forth the anointing because it doesn't have God, it doesn't serve God, it doesn't want to do what God wants it to do. It can't speak because it is not going to speak of God. It's going to speak of itself. It does, doesn't bear any type of fruit. Either a vine or a fig. So can no both yield salt water and fresh water. And then he begins to talk about how who is wise, who is a wise man and a dude with knowledge among you. Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness. So then he begins to say, who is wise among you? Who is mature and who has become seasoned in the Lord? Who has the Lord matured them in their language and the things that they say, in their conduct, 
and their behavior who has been endued with wisdom and knowledge among you. Let them begin to speak. If there's going to be any teachers, if there's going to be anybody that's going to exhort, if there's going to be anybody, let those who have become seasoned, who have learned to tame their tongue, who are, are showing forth the fruit of the Lord in their walk, with their talk, that they will be the ones that would speak forth and be the teachers. Let them show out a good conversation his works with meekness, meaning with humility, with proper and true wisdom of God. This wisdom from God and knowledge. A person who has been seasoned. Let them who is a, of a humble heart and who has humility and uh, who the Lord can give this wisdom to. Let them be the one that speaks. Not just anybody who gets up who just wants to talk because they want to talk. But let the one who has been seasoned in their tongue. But if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts glory not and lie not against the truth that if you say you love God and you hate your brother or sister and you say God I will obey you and follow you but not submit to leadership if you have this type of bittering or striving he says in your heart don't glory in it don't take pride in it some people take joy and pride in their nasty attitude they take pride in treating people bad they take pride in not loving people because all they may have received all their life is people treating them wrong or people doing them bad and that's all they're used to so they give that to other people they throw that off but we should be a people that throws the love of God so when people throw other stuff we're throwing the love of God that we don't have strife or contention among each other we should never have strife among each other if somebody has got an issue with somebody you take it to that person the Bible says that if you have an issue with your brother or sister and you come to the altar with a gift leave the gift at the altar and go and make amends with your brother or sister then come and bring the old gift and offer to God because God ain't go take the gift if you bring it in before like, God I love you I'm bringing this gift no you really don't love me because how can you love me when you don't see me but then the, how can you love the one you can't see but then hate the one you can see it really shows you really don't love me because if you love me you will keep my commandments you will love your neighbor as you love yourself and if you love yourself, you would treat yourself right. You would do yourself right. You wouldn't treat yourself wrong. So, too, do the same thing for your neighbor. Mm -hmm. So, but if you have bitter envy and strife in your heart's glory not, and don't lie against the truth. When the truth has been presented to you, don't lie. Don't try to act like, uh, well, no, I don't hate this person. You know, we good. We on good terms. We cool. No, don't lie against the truth because you can see the jealousy. It comes out of you not happy that that person got that new car. You're not happy that they just got that $2,000 refund. Like, oh yeah, I got that $2,000 refund. Uh, yeah, I'm happy that you got that refund. You're not happy that they got that refund. You're not happy that they just got, they just got that new man that they've been praying for. you like, oh man, you, got, oh, you didn't got that girl. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you happy for you? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy for you. No, you're not happy for them. You got strife in your heart, contention. And every time you come around them, you don't even want to be around them. Like, oh, here they go. They don't tell me about this blessing they got. I ain't trying to hear that. Matter of fact, like, yeah, I can't make it. Yeah, I got, I got some work to do. You know what I'm saying? I know you wanted me to come, but I got some stuff to do. Where really, you didn't have nothing to do. You just didn't want to come around because there was jealousy in you. And when God calls it to the surface and he says, this is what you're dealing with. And you're like, oh, you know, I don't really deal with that. James says, no, don't lie against the truth. This is what is going on during this time. This is what Christians are dealing with. There is too much envy and strife. We should be loving one another and uh, walking together in the Lord. I put up the example with my boy Greg Kills, who was really a pioneer in the things of God. This man was here from 2000 to 2007, y'all, when SBOC started. He stayed and he was faithful. Many people didn't like Greg and some of the stuff he said sometimes. He was kind of quick with the mouth and, you know, and sometimes you might, you know, you, you might not want to listen to what he got to say because he might make you mad. You know, he might say some stuff but like, man, this brother is saying this to me, but I don't, do you know who I am? Like, you know, this and that. But Greg had a heart for God. He had a heart to serve the Lord. And though there were people under him when he was president, they may not have liked all this stuff and may not have always wanted to listen to him, but they had to ultimately understand that submitting to him is not submitting really to him, it's submitting to the Lord because he's the one that God has made the president. And at the end of the day, if they don't submit to him, it's not about him, it's, it's their, their obedience to the man of God, the woman of God, of who God has put into position and God will hold them accountable of how they 
fought against the move of God and what God was trying to do because God anoints from the head down. So whoever is the head, God will give the head the vision. God will give the head the anointing. God will give the head. If they say sanctify fifth with the Holy Ghost, God will bless the head and he will guide the head. And if everybody is not falling in line with the head, then there will be dissension and disunity in the body to where the devil can come in and he can cause division, which is what he wants to do anyway. But Greg was one that was able to to keep his mind and everything stayed on the Lord and it caused people to have a heart to, to where and where there was any envy or strife, Greg was the one that he would come right to the forefront like, look y'all, now we need to get this, this and that together. He would call you out, like he wouldn't just call like certain names, but he would just call certain things out if people weren't doing certain things. Like what y'all need to do, y'all need to start coming to this night walk. We getting this $300 every quarter. Y'all lazy. No good way well, y'all out there doing other stuff on the weekend. Y'all need to come before they cut this money. Y'all want to keep getting this free pizza and Bible study? Then you need to come up. You need to come to night walk. Y'all need to stop being lazy. He just lay it out like 100 people in here. He just lay it out like that. Y'all need to be at the revival. Where y'all been at? I'm talking about you have to go study. You don't need to go study. You need to be at the revival. You need to repent. That's what you did. Greg had the type of temperament to where he didn't. He, I loved him, but he had the type of temper where he would keep it real. He would just come right before everybody after Kevin got done teaching. He'd come up here and he just let you know how he felt right then. But the Lord loved him and blessed him and created him to be a great leader to where there would be, if there was any strife, he would allow the Lord to use him to cut any of that strife to where there was love in the Bible study, to where it could continue to grow, to where y'all would be here right now. If it had not been for the Lord using him and other leaders, where would a lot of us be right now? We might be in some nonsense Bible study yeah. right now, learning about some, some, some craziness right now, learning about there's many ways to get to God right now, you know, the, you know, like this new age movement that's talking about you really don't need uh, salvation. Salvation is whatever you create it to be. And that really you don't need God, really each of us is a God. You know what I'm saying? All of us is a, is a God. We just need to reach our level of divine consciousness. That's what we need to do. It's this new age movement of nonsense that has gone forth. It's sweeping uh, the nation where people they, they, they pick and choose. They grasp stuff from other uh, of, of the face of things that are taught and they mix up this whole new age movement. I was looking at it and I'm like this is some nonsense that you would teach that the, there is no God really is each of us are a God and there is no there is there is no real way to God salvation is whatever you make it out to be you don't need a pastor you don't need a preacher you don't need a list of members you don't need to have some organized church church can be what you want it to be you know, it's this move of a new world order where it's one religion, where it's a little bit of God in all of us because we're all God. We're all divine. And it teaches that man is, uh, is divine. That's what it teaches, that we're divine, we're gods. So we don't need God because we are God. Mm -hmm. So this is why it's so crucial that we stay rooted in the word of God so that we speak the things of God. So when nonsense comes forth, we are able to speak with the word of God, not with our flesh, but with the spirit of God against the things that come contrary to the word of God. This wisdom that he's talking about when those have envy and strife, he says this wisdom descended not from above, but it's earthly, meaning it is sensual and it is devilish. The type of wisdom that when you speak and it's not according to what God is saying, and you allow strife and other things that's in your heart and you don't deal with those things but then you want to get up and you want to start to teach or do these type of things the wisdom that you're getting because you have not tamed your tongue is not a wisdom that's coming from God it's coming from your flesh it's not God speaking, it's you speaking. And that's a lot of what, what y'all saw on that video. When you come into church, you're not doing it for God. You're doing it for yourself. No, that didn't come from the Lord. That came from your flesh that was speaking, saying you're doing it for yourself. At no point in all of your rambling did you say anything that was remotely the truth. Nothing she said was remotely even close to the truth. It showed, and it showed that everybody is now dumber. And I say we dumber, but people were now dumber for having listened to that nonsense. 
So James lays this out that the wisdom that people give when they're strife and envy and not allowing the Lord to come in, but allowing your flesh to come in. This wisdom that you give people now is not wisdom that comes from God, but it's wisdom that the devil is giving. Like, yeah, 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 what you need to do, yeah, you need to just go ahead and tell them how it is. You need to tell them that, that you could, you didn't like them anywhere. You're already in your flesh. Go ahead and just tell them how you really feel about them. The wisdom you start to give them now is not of God, but it's of your flesh. And I'm going to come to this example. I'm going to mention it after verse number 16, where it says, For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. When, when there is envy and strife, people will not be on one accord. When there is envy and strife, there will be division, and the devil will sit back and laugh. So before we speak, before we even open up our mouth, it, this uh, chapter teaches us that the Lord help us to tame our tongue. Tame our tongue to where when we begin to speak, God, we begin to speak based on your word, God. That we speak the wisdom of God, the things of God, the plan of God. That we're speaking life and not death. That we're no longer walking in our old nature. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. That means your mouth should become new. That means your mind should be renewed. That means you should be wanting to love your sister or brother. That means you should have a, a servant's heart, a heart that wants to serve each other, a heart that says, hey, I don't mind getting that for you if you have the means to do it. Hey, I don't mind giving you a ride. I don't mind doing it because I'm doing it as unto the Lord. I'm not doing it so I can bring pride to myself. I drive a van. I love driving a van. I don't do it. So so I can get uh, puffed up and I can say, yeah, man, I drive a church van. You know, I don't get no props for driving a church van. Like, man, y'all know what I do, man? You know, so I drive a church van. You know what I'm saying? I don't know what y'all thought I was. I don't punk out here. I drive a van, man. 15 passenger. You know what I'm saying? Like, man, ain't no, ain't no five-seaters or 15. I got 21 people in there. What y'all thought? We rolling deep in this mug. You know what I'm saying? I don't get no props for talking about I drive a van. That don't mean nothing. So this is not to bring myself glory. This is about doing this as unto the Lord, and I do it with joy. When we serve each other, we do it with joy to bring God's glory and to magnify the Lord. And this example I put up here, that it shows how that when you allow uh, strife and contention to come in, how the enemy can slip in so quickly. And when you allow strife to come in, Real quickly, if you don't check it, you can allow the enemy to use you when you don't even know that the devil is using you. Years ago, and I remember this, and Kevin, he mentions it from time to time, but he ain't mentioned it in a long time, but I'll never forget it. There was a time where there was some strife and envy going on in the Bible study, and there were some things that when Kevin teaches the word, because at the end of the day, the word is the word, y'all, and the word sometimes cut, cuts, and Kevin was teaching about the Holy Ghost. And there was somebody who just didn't agree necessarily with as far as when it comes to the Holy Ghost. Now, that's one thing if you have your own personal opinion and this and that. But it's a whole other thing when you want to try to lead other people straight, especially if you got the Holy Ghost. And you want to tell other people, like, nah, it ain't like this. I got it this way. But I'm not going to tell everybody else that. Mm -hmm. And Kevin, it, I'll never forget it. Reason with the person and reason with the person. And they just wouldn't hear Kevin. And i never forget Kevin when he said it, he spoke about it, that he prophesied it to, the, to this person. And he let them know because you don't want to take heed to the word of God and you have a desire to do your own will. One year from now, you're going to start your own Bible study with the sole pur purpose of competing with student body of Christ. With the sole purpose, one year from now, you're going to create a Bible study. And they said, that's ridiculous. I would never do something like that. And they said, okay, I'm just giving you, he spoke prophesied, he prophesied exactly to them one year from now that they were created a Bible study. And guess what? One year from now, from then, they created a Bible study. From the date that he said they were going to create one, they created a Bible study. Now, when they created a Bible study, it was during the year when Chris was in the uh, presidency. And during that year, they created the Bible study, and someone, it got wind, SBOC, that they created the Bible study, and it was like, oh, yeah, you know, this is not to compete with SBOC. We're just having another Bible study, just like y'all. We was like, okay, SBOC is on Thursday nights. They decided to schedule their Bible study on Thursday nights. The so, SBOC is at 8 p.m. They scheduled their Bible study at 8 p.m. Oh, this ain't no, there's no competition. SBOC was at 427 ERC. They scheduled their Bible study at 427 TUC. <laughs> now, now common sense comes into play. Now this is no competition. 
competition. SBOC had a group of people that was coming out, 60, 70, 80 people. They sent a mass invite out to most of everybody that comes to SBOC that comes to this Bible study, but we're not competing in this Bible study. And over time, they got people, they all started coming to the Bible study, and I'll never forget the words of wisdom that Chris had said during that time. And I said, man, Chris, man, this other Bible study tried to compete with us and this and that. And Chris said something with wisdom. Before he spoke, he spoke with wisdom. He said, he said what was exactly in the scripture. He said that if it's of God, it's going to stand. But if it's not, it's not going to stand. Jesus. And that was so profound because it was a man in the Bible that said the exact same thing. That if this is of God, that uh, you, you will find yourself kicking against the pricks that you aren't going to be able to fight against God. Where you will find yourself even fighting against God. And that Bible said you blew up. They had like 100 people. And they had all different type of crazy stuff that they was teaching in there. And a person had their opportunity to teach what they wanted to teach in the Bible study. And we loved the person, but they were teaching nonsense. But it's something about the truth, y'all, that they, there's only for so long you're going to listen to nonsense. And after a while, there was 100 people dropped down to 75, 50, 25, to where it dropped down to a handful. All the people that was in here that went over there came right back on, back over here. They said, yeah, we was only over there for a little while, but uh, we need to come back over here. <laughs> and even people... Even in them starting that nonsense, people who hadn't even heard about SPOC, when these people found out where the other people were going, people who didn't know nothing about SPOC was like, where y'all going? Oh, I never heard about SPOC, but I'm about to come on over. So like, even in their disobedience and rebellion, God caused it to work together for good. Because then some people who didn't even know about SPOC came into SPOC. And after the Bible study was over, I'll never forget their words when they said, this is where the word of God is going for. This is where the truth is going for. We were just over at this other Bible study we've been going to. And just to tell y'all the truth, man, they've been over there teaching some nonsense. This person saying this, that person saying that, that person on the board says this, this person believes that. Five people on the board believe in different things. Mm. But we all Christian, we all love the Lord. But no, they allow the enemy real quick because of strife and envy. Because they had an issue not with Kevin, but they had an issue with the word. It's never an issue with uh, the, the person that's speaking. That's why James encourages that not everybody teach because we offend a lot of people. But it's not us that they're really offended with. It's the word of God they have a problem with. They have a problem with the word. And the person had a problem with the word of God. And to this day, one day I saw the person, and when I, you know, I, I'm with joy. When I see people like, I see the Lord, I say, hey, what's going on? I saw them coming. I had that excitement. And all they can do is drop their head, and they was like, almost like going the other direction. They didn't even want to even embrace me or the other brother, uh, my other brother in the Lord, who, uh, B. James. Me and B. James, we were about to go up and hug him like, hey, what's going on? It's good to see you. Didn't even want to look us in the eye. Because the conviction fell on them that they allowed the enemy at that moment to get the best of them. They allowed their mouth and their flesh to step into this. Instead of taming their tongue and submitting to what the word of God is saying, they allowed their flesh to get the best of them. And ultimately, those souls that were in that room when they were teaching, if those souls go astray and they die and they go to hell, they will be held accountable for every one of those souls in that room because of what they taught. Whatever nonsense... That they taught if they were not sent by God, not called by God in rebellion, they will give an account for every single word they said. And every single person's blood will be on their hands. Hmm. If that person perishes and dies and go to hell. That's why the word of God, that uh, having sound teaching is so crucial. That's why taming the tongue is so crucial. That's why James Adam, he speaks to encourage the church. Tame your tongue. And be careful in the things that you say. Make sure God starts to season your words to where when you begin to speak, you're used as speaking from the spirit of God and not your flesh. Because you will give an account for the things that come out of your mouth. And you want it to be something that's of good and not evil. That calls souls to be saved and not go to hell. You want to have not been in rebellion, but you want to have been walking with God. Verse number 17, and we almost done, y'all. I didn't think I'd be going this line, but y'all know me. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure. So the wisdom that God gives is pure. It's undefiled. It's peaceable. It's gentle. It's easy to be entreated, meaning it's full of mercy. It's come, uh, or it's easy to be entreated, meaning that it's without partiality. It's, 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 it's received real well. It's not something that causes contention. It's something that is received by others. It's full of mercy. It's full of good works. 
It's without partiality, meaning that it's not a respecter of persons. When the word goes forth, it's the word. It doesn't matter who's sitting in the, in the room. Whether it's a poor man or it's President Barack Obama, it's not a respecter of persons. If President Obama, Barack Obama is in the atmosphere, if the message is dealing with repent and uh, get baptized in Jesus' name, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and there's a hail that awaits you if you don't get right with God, it's not going to be tailored a little bit because Obama's in the back. It doesn't matter. Obama needs to repent just like everybody else because he, God is not a respecter specter or persons because Obama will give an account before the Lord on how he did not answer the call of God when he said get right right now so it's not a respecter of persons and it's without hypocrisy meaning that it's, it is uh, without insincerity it is full of uh, truth and the word of God is straightforward it's full of compassion but yet it is straightforward when God gives wisdom it is pure I was looking for that I was like where is it but in the wisdom of God, it brings peace and is gentle. And 2 Timothy 2.24 teaches us that we must not strive with man, but we must be gentle. Apt to teach, patient. We need to be apt to teach, patient. We have to be patient. It says the servant of the Lord should not strive with people. You should not be in contention with each other, but we must be apt to teach people. Very gentle because God is gentle. He's very long-suffering with all of us because all of us went astray. And didn't come to God when he called us. But so God was long-suffering towards us. And so too we should be that way towards others. Patient. Not quick to speak, but slow to speak. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. With our mouth we bear a fruit of righteousness sown in peace between each other. Matthew 5 and 9 talks about that... Um, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Those whose desire is peace is not to cause contention, strife, or envy in other people, but they are the, the peacemakers of those who will be called the sons of God because they have such a pure heart. They don't have a desire to have contention and arguing and all that stuff, but they have a heart. <coughs> sorry, y'all. But they have a heart of peace. So we should always have this type of heart of peace. So day in and day out, uh, before we speak, James begins to edify us and to encourage us that we tame our tongue so that when we do open our mouth to speak, we begin to speak the things of God, that we begin to speak to edify each other, that whatever we say, even when you walk out this room, even if somebody do some nonsense and cut you off or say the wrong thing at you, or throw something at you. Now, I'm like nobody throwing nothing at me. And y'all you know, know me on the road. People be getting on my nerves. I, you know, I be wanting to <laughs> lay hands on people and pray for them. But, you know, we have to get to a place where we tame our tongue to where we speak life and not death. So that we ultimately can be a reflection truly of Christ and of what he has called us to do. So we ultimately make it to heaven. Amen? Amen. All right, I'm done.